So it was really cool coming back to do the vocals on this thing because um, I did backing vocals on the original and I worked really closely with their singer at the time, Mark. And, and it was a really cool experience. Mark is one of them genuinely good guys that you just really want to hang out with and, and, try, and try and work on things to make it as good as it possibly could be. My vocal range is probably a little bit bigger than Mark's, so it's given us a bit more flexibility to do more things with the vocal lines. Now, it's not to say a big vocal range means you're a better vocalist, mind you. Um, I, I think if you asked anybody if they thought that Lemmy or Alice Cooper or somebody was you know, a bad vocalist or not a legend, you would get a punch in the face if you disagreed, and rightly so. Um, but I, I think just just by the pure, purely for the fact that I do have a larger vocal range, it allowed us to do a lot more with the tracks this time to uh, to expand on the ideas that they that they had. When the guys sent me the vocal tracks, um, they'd already recorded all of the guitars, all of the bass and keyboards and everything to a drum machine at home. And um, they, they were the final tracks. They weren't demo tracks. They were the actual tracks. Um, and I think the intent was to either mix it themselves or send it away to somebody else after my vocals were on there. I remarked to them that it sounded a little bit small, so they're going to need, it's going to need quite a bit of work to make it sound the way that they probably intended it to sound. And I think during the course of those conversations, it dawned on them that we're all on the same page about what we wanted to hear from this particular album. So I kind of became de facto producer once again, which was kind of funny actually because I, I did produce the first album with the guys back in 2002 and um, as, as we spoke about before the, the technology limitations played a really really big part in in what we we're able to do plus the inexperience I've, I've done so much productions since since that time especially in the last five or ten years now that I'm in my bespoke custom studio um, I've got a I've got a much better reference point to, to mix rather than what I was using at the time the other problem that we had was the studio just really kind of wasn't the right studio for what we were doing drum wise as well. Um, we were working with Dungeons drummer at the time, Steve Moore, who was a fantastic drummer and he did a killer job, really, really amazing job considering the complexity of the material. But as we found with Dungeons' A Rise to Power album, the big problem with the drums at the time was Steve-O's drums weren't great for recording and the room was just far too small for such an aggressive player. And Steve-O hit hard. I listen back to the stuff that he's done on the Ilium things now, and it, it blows my mind what he was able to achieve with with that sort of with that with the complexity of the material in the short amount of time that we had to do it. But ultimately, it was still a compromise because we just couldn't capture it right. It was in the wrong room. It was with the wrong gear. So we knew that if we we're going to redo this sort of stuff, then we'd need either a drum machine that sounded really really good, or a, a, a new drummer. Just due to the way the guys recorded the drum machine, we didn't have a lot of flexibility to, to make the drum machine sound good. So I always prefer to work with the drummer. So naturally, we got Tim Yatras in. So Tim Yatras, freak player. Um, I've, I've worked with TY together on so many different things, ranging from pop to black metal. And um, I keep asking him back because he, he's just that good. So we just spent a weekend doing drums with TY and um, nailed it, naturally. And this time, because we've got like a proper studio that suits his style of drumming, his size kit, and we have the gear to make it sound good, we're able to pull the drum sounds that we're really wanting to hear. We spend a lot of time working on the sounds of all the other instruments as well, um, re EQing the guitars, compressing things, just making it sounding, sounding good. So what I wanted to try and do with this album is trying to make it sound metal. Um, and I know this sounds like a bit of a fun, funny thing to say with a metal band, but I think... As, as Ilium's discography went along, their production got dramatically better. They were working with fantastic guys like Tommy Hansen, and he did, he did a great job. And they worked with amazing vocalists and, and do all this great stuff. But I think, for me personally, and, I, and I'm sure the guys might disagree, um, there was always a, a hint of aggression that I would have preferred to hear in the, in, the, in the style. So my goal was to try and bring some more aggression and some more metal into, into the production of this. But that was tricky because you hear stuff like, say, Half-Life or Embrace the Myth, where they're obviously metal songs. They're, they're bordering on thrash in places. But then you'll hear something like Semblance, where it's very, very delicate, soft rock. However, in Semblance, even the last half of that is actually quite heavy metal. 
So there was a big juggling act and a lot of compromises had to be made about how we wanted to do, do production. But ultimately, I think we ended up with something which worked well for all of the different styles. And um, it, it all fit together in a really kind of weirdly consistent patchwork. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think it's it's probably one of the most aggressive Ilium albums so far. And uh, I, I personally, depending who they would like to work with in the future, I'd like to hear that you know, say stay as a bit of a mainstay of their sound as they go along.